Good evening. I'm Janet Gornick, Professor of Political Science and Sociology here at the CUNY Graduate Center, and I'm also Director of the Stone Center on Socioeconomic Inequality, one of the hosts for this evening's event, and it's my pleasure to welcome you this evening. Welcome to those of you in the Alabash Recital Hall, and welcome to our viewers joining via live stream. Let me just say a few words about the City University of New York and the Graduate Center for those of you who might not be familiar with CUNY or the Graduate Center. CUNY, which of course serves the city of New York, is the country's largest urban public university and the third largest university system in the United States. We have 25 campuses, about 275,000 matriculated students, and nearly 7,000 professors. Among the overarching themes to be raised this evening is inequality. And in my view, there's no more appropriate setting in which to discuss inequality than here at CUNY. CUNY itself is a massive project aimed at reducing socioeconomic inequality and enabling intergenerational mobility. When our first college, the City College of New York, was founded in 1847, it was described as an experiment whose purpose was to educate the children of the whole people. And over 170 years later, our mission is intact. CUNY, with a design unique in the United States, has dedicated one of its campuses to graduate study, and that's the Graduate Center, where we are this evening. The Graduate Center, a small school embedded in this large system, enrolls nearly 5,000 graduate students across an array of disciplines. The Graduate Center is strongly committed to CUNY's historic mission. We provide access to doctoral education for diverse groups of talented students, including those who have been underrepresented in higher education. In the last decade, the Graduate Center has set among its highest priorities, expanding our capacity in research and teaching in the field of socioeconomic inequality with an emphasis on empirical work, high quality data, and quantitative methods. One of our primary goals is to contribute to and to deepen the complicated national and international conversation about economic inequality that has received so much attention in recent years. This evening's event will address several of the economic, political, and institutional challenges that many of us here at the Graduate Center and throughout CUNY have grappled with in recent years. The Graduate Center is now home to more than 30 research centers and institutes, including our own, the Stone Center on Socioeconomic Inequality. The center's mission is to build and disseminate knowledge related to the causes, nature, and consequences of multiple forms of socioeconomic inequality. The Stone Center has six core faculty members, myself, Leslie McCall, who's on stage, uh, Miles Korak, Paul Krugman, Salvatore Morelli, and Bronco Milanovic. Uh, tonight, the Graduate Center and the Stone Center are delighted to be partnering with The Guardian, whose new series, Broken Capitalism, addresses the question of why discontent with capitalism is rising and asks if it can be repaired. Richard Reeves, from whom you'll hear in just a moment, is the guest editor for this Guardian series. Richard is bringing together an extraordinary group of scholars, politicians, writers, and activists to reflect on this critical topic. I encourage you to follow the series, which will run throughout the summer, and we're extremely pleased tonight to offer this companion live event, which will examine the topic of democracy and capitalism asking the fundamental and rather ambitious question, can they coexist? Tonight's event is also part of the Graduate Center's two-year initiative of scholarship and public programs called The Promise and Perils of Democracy, which is supported in part by a grant from the Carnegie Corporation of New York. And now, without further ado, I'd like to introduce our moderator for tonight, Richard Reeves. Richard is a senior fellow in economic studies at the Brookings Institution, where he's also co-director of the Center on Children and Families. He's author of the highly praised book, Dream Hoarders, How the American Upper Middle Class is Leaving Everyone in the Dust, Why That's a Problem and What to Do About It. Richard will introduce our distinguished panel. Richard, I turn the evening over to you. Thank you, Janet, uh, for that great introduction. And it's my great pleasure to be moderating this panel today and to be guest editing the Guardian series. It's a deliberately provocative title, of course, the idea that capitalism and democracy 
can't coexist uh, is a provocative one. It's one we wouldn't have even asked ourselves not so very long ago. And part of the thinking behind the title of this evening's event, but also the series, is to think about the connections between our political systems, our forms of governance and democracy, and our economic systems. Because it wasn't that long ago when we wouldn't have been asked, not only not asking a question whether they can coexist, but also they seem like natural bedfellows. Um, those long enough memories will remember the end of history being declared, the end of the Cold War, and there's just this sense that broadly market-based uh, economies would come together, converge together with broadly representative political systems. That seemed to be the way the world was converging, but now we're seeing the rise of illiberal democracies, the rise of state forms of capitalism, and a real question being asked now, which is how do the traditional ways in which market-based economies operate really interact with political systems and particularly with democratic systems. And Janet's already set us up very well by talking about the rise in inequality, sluggish income growth, especially in the middle and the bottom, and growing fears about climate and climate crisis. The promise of capitalism is one that is being questioned uh, as, I would say, as never before, <laughs> but certainly more strongly questioned than in recent history. In some polling, you'll now see significant numbers of Americans, especially millennials and those who support the Democratic Party, Democrat Party saying that they actually kind of veer more towards socialism than capitalism. On closer investigation, of course, what they really mean is more like social democracy, something more like a welfare state. And so being clear in our definitions is important too. And so what I'm going to do is introduce our three speakers who are going to speak to this kind of question of what does it mean to be a citizen in a, both a political democracy and a participant in a capitalist economy. What does that mean now? Where are the pressure points? Why are we having this conversation at all? They'll each give some brief comments. Um, I'll then moderate a discussion between the panelists, and then we'll throw it open to the floor for q and A. I'm going to offer brief introductions because obviously uh, you can look online to to see more about our distinguished panel. But I, and I'm going to introduce them in the order in which they're going to speak. So first, we're going to hear from Andrew Yang. Andrew Yang is a tech entrepreneur. He's a philanthropist. He founded Venture for America, and he's author of most recent book of The War on Normal People: The Truth About America's Disappearing Jobs and Why Universal Basic Income is our future. I apologize in advance to the other panelists. I don't have their book in my hand, but that's because they didn't just give it to me, whereas Andrew cleverly gave me the book literally as I'm walking on the stage. So that's excellent marketing. Um, and uh, Mr. Yang uh, is, of course, uh, uh, well known for other activities. Um, he's enjoying a particularly high public profile right now. Uh, many people are supporting him and are interested in his policies, um, but just to reiterate that, of course, he is here today as a thought leader. Um, and then we're going to hear from Leslie, who's on your far right, Leslie McCall. Um, Janet's already mentioned she's presidential professor of sociology here at CUNY, and she's the executive director of the Stone Center that uh, Janet runs. She is the author of The Undeserving Rich, American Beliefs About Inequality, Opportunity, and Redistribution. And then you'll hear last from Vanessa Williamson, who's on your left. Uh, Vanessa is a senior fellow at the best think tank in the world, <laughs> the Brookings Institution. Um, it's, it's just, it's, there are surveys of these things, apparently. Uh, and she is author of Read My Lips, Why Americans Are Proud to Pay Taxes. Um, and so between the, between the panelists, we have really rich uh, experience of both business, but also academia and political science. And so I'll stop talking and hand over to Andrew to kick us off. Welcome. Well, thank you, Richard, and uh, thank you for the generous introduction. Uh, it's true, I, I do carry copies of my book around, uh, just about everywhere I go. Uh, so I, I was fascinated by the question and the uh, scaffolding for this conversation as well, because I grew up thinking that capitalism and democracy were natural bedfellows. And that the problem right now is that we're dealing with this uh, distorted version of each, uh, and so now it seems like neither is functioning very well, uh, which is accurate. And one of the quotes I like to share is from a friend of mine, Eric Weinstein, who said that we never knew that capitalism was going to get eaten by its son, technology, uh, which is unfortunately the era we're entering where we're entering this winner-take-all economy 
that is breaking down many of the capitalist relationships we take for granted. So for example, in the 1970s, if I started a successful company, you could make a number of assumptions. I would have to hire lots of people to fuel my growth. I would need to treat them moderately well, maybe so they could buy my offering, like Henry Ford, and buy my uh, car. And I would need to care about what happens in my backyard because my workers live there, I live there, et cetera. Today, none of that is true. I can start a successful company that does not need to hire lots of people, or if I do hire people, they have a very specialized skill set. If I hire lots of people, let's call them Uber drivers, I do not need to treat them very well, uh, I do not need to give them benefits, and I don't have to care about my own backyard because I don't sell in any one place, I sell everywhere. Uh, and so there are all of these underpinnings of what you thought the economic benefits would be to growth that are not translating to the broader population and then you have a democracy that's being held captive in many ways by the same moneyed interests. Uh, and that's why young people today are coming of age uh, where they think capitalism doesn't serve their interests very well. Uh, and they're correct. Uh, so you can't fault them. Uh, and so uh, if I had grown up during this era, I too would be very dubious given the record levels of, of student loan debt and the underemployment and everything else. So we need to fix both systems. We need to fix both capitalism so that it functions better for more Americans, and then we need to return democracy to our people as fast as possible. Thank you. Leslie. Thanks, thanks very much, Richard. Uh, so I wanna back into this uh, specifically looking at the issue of economic inequality, which is what I study, and which has already been raised as uh, perhaps one of the central tensions between capitalism on the one hand, which fosters inequality and today fosters extreme levels of inequality, and democracy on the other hand, which seeks to alleviate inequality, and in fact does alleviate inequality, but certainly not to the extent that it should nowadays. Uh, and I wanna illustrate this tension first with an anecdote uh, that I think also offers a little bit of historical context for the discussion uh, that we'll have tonight. So I started studying the politics of inequality in the early 2000s, and specifically public opinion and public views about economic inequality, about the economy, about related public policy issues. And starting with the 2004 presidential election, friends and colleagues of mine who knew that I studied this issue would say to me, wow, Leslie, isn't it great that the issue of economic inequality is receiving so much attention these days? Uh, and then they said it again, a different group of people said it again in 2008, and then in 2012 and 2016, and of course, nowadays, everyone says, isn't the most important issue in this year's, uh, or 2020's presidential election, isn't it economic inequality? Um, and so this has been a, a real concern because in fact, economic inequality hasn't really changed very much over that time period, um, really hasn't changed at all. If anything, it's, it's grown. Uh, and so my response has always been uh, throughout this period uh, pretty much the same, which is yes, it's a step forward that politicians and other uh, thought leaders uh, and influential groups such as journalists, uh, academics, uh, policy advocates, business leaders even, that they're starting to catch up, is what I argue. They're starting to catch up with where the American people have been for a long time, which is actually opposed to extreme levels of economic inequality. So they're catching up, but one thing that they have avoided uh, talking about is what I consider, based on my research, the central problem uh, that Americans are concerned about, which is the lack of a fair economy and the lack of a broadly, broadly inclusive uh, economy, what some people call stakeholder capitalism, uh, and which I also see as very much rooted in the civil rights movement, and in particular, equal employment and equal pay doctrine. Uh, so coming back to the present, um, I think the fact, as Richard said, the fact that we are talking about this issue in such bold, grandiose terms as capitalism uh, and democracy, uh, I think is very much uh, a step forward because up until this point, the discussion in the past uh, presidential elections, and I'm just using that as an example, this has been true throughout in the political discussion, I don't believe that uh, that elite level political discussion has fairly represented 
uh, the American people and the public interest on issues of economic inequality, and maybe that is starting to change. Thank you, Liz. I just want to say it's past time talking about it. We should do something about it. Yeah, absolutely. <laughs> Vanessa. So when I was uh, asked to think about this question of whether capitalism and democracy can coexist, the, the sort of pundity answer that occurred to me, which I'm going to try and defend, is that we don't know because we haven't tried. Um, and I, I, I really do mean that in a way, because when you think about uh, well, I mean, the, the basic tension, right, which we've already been talking about, is if, you have co if capitalism concentrates wealth, it thereby concentrates power, right? And if we concentrate power, that is at odds with the democratic system, right? And you might consider that there's some kind of threshold below which a little bit of concentration, not so bad, but certainly I think we'd all agree that we're on the far side of whatever that threshold is. But when we think about how we've developed capitalism, we've never done it in a way that valued people equally. And you only have to look as far as the gender pay gap, uh, the racial wealth gap, to see that some people's labor has never been fairly valued. And those are the same people whose political voices have never been fairly valued. And so I think that if we're gonna think about whether capitalism and democracy can coexist, we first have to ask ourselves if we've ever given either the testing that um, it might warrant. And in particular, I think we should think about um, whether we can imagine a system that creates immense inequality uh, as acceptable if we actually do think of all people as equal. Thank you, and thank you to all of you for um, keeping your comments so brief at the beginning and giving us plenty of time for discussion. I wanna push, uh, I think I'll probably push all of you on this, the nature of the problem and whether it's an economic failure or it's a political failure to deal with economic trends. And I think this is quite an important distinction to make in this debate, because you can say that capitalism, market economies generate inequality. Yes, they do, they're supposed to. They only work if they generate inequality. Um, but we then have a collective responsibility to ensure that the winners don't win too big and the losers don't get kind of left behind, but that's a political decision. And in fact, depending on how you calculate it, if the US just redistributed more, along the lines of other countries, then the resulting levels of inequality wouldn't be that different. So I guess what I'm asking, is there a danger here that we're blaming capitalism for the failures of the political system um, and that we could, shouldn't instead just be trying to fix it at a political level? So you could do two things, for example, you could redistribute more, but you could also reform campaign finance, right? So the accumulation of wealth as power can have a very different effect in a country that doesn't have um, funding of politics to one that does. So. The broader question is, are we, who's really at fault here? Why don't we start with you, Vanessa, because you kick me off and then we'll go along. So I think that it's a mistake to imagine that markets aren't political by nature. Uh, markets are a political outcome, exactly the same as the tax system. Um, because markets are governed by laws, and laws are made by lawmakers who in our country we still elect, for now. Uh, <laughs> the, um, I always do. Anyway, the... My point is that when you're thinking about a market system, it's not something that somehow precedes the political economy, right? It's the, the market isn't something that happens. It's not that everyone has a couple of apple trees and then goes to the market and exchanges and then the king came along and took some taxes, right? There's not, it's not sort of a, um, a simpl simplified version of the economy. Entire industries rise and fall based on whether we enforce antitrust laws. Uh, the legalization of marijuana has created entire industries that are now legal industries that never existed before. So I think it's a mistake to imagine that market economies have, have sort of, there's, a, there's an economy that pre-exists the political institutions. And I think that when we think about what the solutions are to the concentration of wealth, we need to think both about the, the laws that govern how money gets distributed first and the laws about how the money gets redistributed thereafter. Right, so markets are political institutions and pre-distribution as well as redistribution is a political decision. Andrew, do you want to weigh in? Yeah, no, well, the, the example I use that everyone understands most directly is how did Amazon pay zero in taxes in 2018? How did a trillion dollar tech company pay less in federal taxes than the vast majority of the people in this room? And that is a colossal political failure at the highest levels. I mean, it's clearly com like completely opposite of what you'd want, particularly because Amazon is soaking up another $20 billion in commerce every year that is now pushing 30% of malls and Main Street stores to close. And being a retail worker is still the most common job in this country. Uh, the average retail worker is a 39-year-old woman making between $10 and $11 an hour. So if you look at that equation, 30% of stores close, 
cashiers get sent home, meager savings, uh, not much in the way of uh, path forward, and zero in return. Like, like that's uh, public policy and a political failure uh, at the highest levels. And so, you know, like we've created this system and then people look around to your point that's like, oh, well, you know, market. <laughs> I mean, it makes it, uh, and every other advanced economy already has a mechanism in place to avoid something like Amazon paying zero taxes. And that was not an anomaly. Their lifetime tax rate is only 3%. And so I, I uh, you know, you look at that and you say, well, like uh, any of the cries of like, where are the resources? It's like, where are the resources? <laughs> you know, it's like, you just look around at who's benefiting uh, the most from our, our, our current arrangement, which I agree is a completely political decision we, that we've done, but we've done it very passively, and now we have to actively correct for it. Uh, and so one suggestion that would help everything is that if we just gave every American citizen 100 democracy dollars that you could then contribute to any candidate or political campaign, that would wash out the lobbyist money by a factor of five. That would actually make it so that politicians would listen to constituents as opposed to people. Because right now as a politician, if you get people behind you, you then have to get the money someplace else. And who has the money? Rich companies and rich individuals. So who do you listen to? The rich companies and rich individuals. If you could get 10,000 people behind you and that's a million dollars and then the company starts waving 50, 100,000 at you, you'd be like, I don't care about your 50, 100,000. I'll just like listen to the, the people who voted me into office. So that's the kind of dramatic fix that we need to try and strengthen a democracy that would then turn to the Amazons of the world and so, say, you're paying zero taxes, makes no sense at all. So rather than try and stop the corporate money, you crowd it out with citizens' money, basically. But I want to ask you yes, the Amazon no, thing. Right. I'm going to come to you a little bit. The Amazon is a great I example, I think, because if you're sitting on the board of Amazon under current regulatory environments and you're making a decision about what to do about reducing your tax bill, you've got shareholders, then the right thing to do is try and reduce your tax bill as much as possible. But, but there are many they're, they're people who are blaming Amazon. But, so, so, but the people who are attacking Amazon, they're saying there's something wrong with Amazon. What I think I'm hearing you say, and Leslie's going to weigh in, is Amazon aren't doing anything wrong. They're playing by the rules of the game. It's the game that's at fault. And it does seem to me that's quite an important distinction in who, in who we decide is at fault here. Who are the villains? If, if, if people are just profit maximizing in a market economy, that's kind of what they're supposed to do, isn't it? Or are they supposed to act differently? Yeah, Leslie, I, I, I'm let, yeah, let, 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 so let Leslie come in and we'll come back. I, I just want to say it's ridiculous that we're like berating these corporate leaders like they're supposed to self-regulate. Like that makes no sense. It's their job to make as much money as possible. Right, well, and I think it's that, our job. To I make think sure that's an know. answer to the question. Then what about you, Leslie? Yeah, or the other I mean, question? I I, I want to take the question really seriously because um, in in reality, what politicians are doing is they are taking a hands off right, uh, perspective on the economy. You know, that there's technological change, right, there's globalization, there are these dynamics that, that we as politicians can't interfere with. And therefore, uh, or if we do interfere with them, then, uh, then there might be job loss, for example, right? And so we can see what Amazon has done on this very issue of threatening job loss, right, and, and, and imposing uh, or intervening in political processes in the city of Seattle, in New York City, all throughout, actually overturning past legislation in Seattle that was meant to increase taxes uh, on um, individuals uh, within, actually on corporations that make more than $20 million in revenue um, and the tax would be on the corporations per employee head. This was passed and it, in, by the Seattle City Council in order to help fund housing, more affordable housing. Um, apparently, and I'm not an expert on this, right, but, but I think there are parallels to, to the New York City case, but apparently Amazon had said that they were supportive of this policy. Well, it turns out they weren't supportive, and they created an organization with Starbucks and other uh, large companies called, uh, what was it called? No Taxes on Jobs. Mm -hmm. Okay? Yeah. So the fear is about if you do regulate, right, uh, then corporations can come back and say, ah, I'm taking my jobs and yep. leaving. Okay. Uh, so that's the reality. Yeah, and again, they're, well, that's the reality. they're able to do what Vanessa was talking about, which is to turn economic power into political power. It's the exactly. way that the spheres of power, how porous are the boundaries between them. But Vanessa, I want to come to you and ask you to, to respond to the, my challenge on Amazon not doing anything wrong, partly because your own work 
uh, is about attitudes towards tax, I think more among individuals, but, um, and wrap in a question which I want to ask all of you, but I'll ask you first, which is the sense of what does a citizen owe to the collective, and what does it mean as an act of citizenship as an individual to be paying taxes or contributing, but maybe also uh, as a company? Yeah, so I think that first of all, if we're going to talk about the ways in which economic power uh, affects our political system, part of it is campaign finance, but the other part is that we have starved the public sector in these really critical ways. Um, legislators don't have the resources they need, so they rely on lobbyists. So people don't, you know, people don't like to talk about the fact that Congress needs more money. Not so that we can you know, fly congressmen around in planes more effectively, but so that they can hire the staff that they need, so that the only information they get about legislation doesn't come from you know, the Amazons of the world. right? So I think that's a really big piece of it when we think about how to rebalance uh, political power and economic inequality. Um, on the question of taxation, uh, so my book has a controversial title. Um, I say that Americans are proud to pay taxes, but being proud is not the same as being happy. And if you look for this rhetoric, you really hear it all the time. People talk about themselves as taxpayers. They say, I pay my taxes, and which is weird because paying taxes is mandatory, so like giving yourself credit for doing so seems a little odd. Um, but it's a really common rhetorical device in the United States. And it's actually backed by a lot of civic sentiment. People see tax paying as part of their obligation as a citizen, right? Um, and it, it, as something that they do to contribute to their community. And uh, you know, I sort of pushed people on this in interviews. In surveys, the, the rates are remarkable. You get 90 plus, 95 plus, sometime percent of Americans agreeing that tax paying is a civic duty, which is almost unheard of in survey data. Similar questions can be asked about whether Elvis is still alive, then you get 90, 90 plus percent of Americans agreeing on something. But I thought this was just, you know, nice, you know, happy talk in a survey. But the thing is, it comes up in interviews. So if you talk to people about taxation, it doesn't take long before they start talking about, you know, that they feel that their government owes them something. And not necessarily in the form of a check, although I would imagine that's pretty popular too. Um, but in the sense that they, they chipped in, so they deserve to be heard. And people get very, very angry. They bring it up without being asked, which I always think is a real sign that it's something that someone actually cares about. This idea that there are these corporations out pay, there paying less in taxes than I did, and I'm you know, making $30,000 a year or whatever it is. Those kinds of comments are, are very common. And I think, you know, fundamentally, uh, it's a very positive trait that Americans still, after many decades of anti-tax rhetoric in this country, still use taxation as a way of talking about what contribution, what part of one's labor one should give to the public. Okay, so I'm going to put some of these together and I'll ask uh, the question, maybe we'll start with you, Leslie, and come back this way, which is, so what we're hearing is economic inequality is real and is growing. Uh, it's a very salient political issue. Uh, we're seeing huge economic divisions geographically, occupationally, uh, certainly in terms of people's pay packets, big wealth gaps, etc. So in e economic inequality, big problem. People are really worried about that. People are proud, if not happy, to pay their taxes and they know that the system's not working for them, right? I'm just summarizing kind of various things that I've heard from the three of you so far. So why are we where we are then? If all of those things are true, why are we actually going through an era where, if anything, policy is going the other way? Policy is going to increase inequality. Um, certainly fiscal policy will at the moment. We're not seeing any, so what, if the ingredients that you've all identified are correct, why are we getting this dish served to us? <laughs> because the, the way you've just described it, we should be living in a democratic, socialist America already. So what's the gap between the analysis and action? Maybe, Leslie, why don't you start with you? Sure. Uh, so we've already talked about one, uh, one pathway, which is uh, the economic power and influence uh, that people with a lot of money have on, on public policy, right? Um, so, but I want to talk about the sort of other side of this, which is even apart from the influence that money has on politics, I actually think the politicians genuinely believe that they cannot affect the economy, that they cannot intervene in the economy um, in, in really significant ways. Uh, maybe the only exception is the minimum wage, which is hugely popular. Uh, but yet there's a lot of debate and controversy over the minimum wage as well, um, uh, lifting it up to, the, to $15. Um, so I, I think this is really a, a major hurdle. And because politicians don't offer genuine 
uh, remedies to the problem of low wages, to the lack of benefits. These are workplace problems, right? So we're not talking about solutions like increasing taxes on the rich. I'm talking about changing the work uh, environment, um, compensation, benefits, and so on. Uh, these kinds of uh, policies are just pretty much off limits. And what I would argue is that that discourages voters. They're not interested in politics because the kinds of policies that they would like to see, which is essentially uh, a, a stronger, uh, more um, uh, thriving uh, economy for everyone, that that hasn't been on the table. So that discourages participation, and I think that's extremely important. There's this mismatch, in other words, between what politicians are offering in terms of solving these problems and what people actually want. There's almost like a collective fatalism about our ability to do it. But you're, you've already mentioned the fact, and this I think will help you, Andrew, um, maybe motivate some of your own work. If you say this is going to kill jobs, then it's not quite game over in terms of political debate, but it's really difficult to recover from that. And so a higher minimum wage does reduce employment, right? at the margins in some circumstances, but the benefits will mostly outweigh it, right? So, yeah, if you, the best studies, I think Kruger card, uh, this is get really boring really fast, but uh, Kruger card, so do, they show some effect, or CBO, some effect, right? It's almost impossible to believe that raising the price of labor won't have some effect on the labor market, but they tend to be pretty marginal. In the long run, probably increases in productivity, blah, 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 right? But if there's any evidence it's gonna cost any jobs at all, then all the other benefits that come from it, reducing poverty, re et cetera, just get blown out of the water because jobs, everyone cares so much about jobs, and if they're afraid of jobs, then it almost ends the debate right there, which is why you might think about something else. Yeah, I mean, just, on. just, just one last point on this. Um, the problem is that then people think that it's jobs and that's it, versus what kind of jobs, right? I mean, that's the key thing. Any job will do, so, yeah, but it's so, not true. So, you know, the, the example of Amazon in New York City, a very, very tough issue. You know, I'm not gonna pretend that uh, you know, there was a right and wrong answer here. But um, so the loss of 25,000 jobs, you, know, you can't uh, uh, treat that lightly. On the other hand, then that becomes the center of the conversation, that it's only about those 25,000 jobs versus all of the other aspects of the inequality issue that are so central. It's not just about the jobs, but the character of the jobs, the pay, the benefits, well. and all yeah. of the other surrounding jobs uh, as well as lots of infrastructure and housing. There's so many issues involved. Okay, Vanessa and then Andrew. Yeah, I think that one of the sort of paradoxical aspects of this is that as the economy gets weaker and as the social safety net has been weakened, your need for a job gets stronger, right? So you might imagine that, that some part of that rhetoric actually grows as you undercut every kind of security. I, I wanted to make one additional point about why. It's a very interesting point though, because then it's a vicious circle, isn't yeah. it? Then you've created a situation where the very absence of support means that the job... Right, so it can actually get harder to convince people to believe that change is possible you know, when people's lives get harder, and that just makes sense. It's unfortunate, um, and it's something we have to overcome. The other point I wanted to make was that when we're thinking about why we don't get policy outcomes that look like what any re re regular poll of Americans would tell you, which is that there are all sorts of things like family leave, minimum wage, Medicare, you know, all these policies that are hugely popular, um, why we don't have them, and why instead we have policies that were hugely unpopular, like the Tax Cuts and Jobs Act. I think it's important to remember that in general, public opinion does not make public policy, right? What makes public policy is organized interests operating through the party system. And there's no reason really to expect that average opinion would drive policy in general because politics requires organization, but especially in a system like ours, which is so inertia bound and was frankly built to avoid majority rule, right? Yeah. Um, no, no. Uh, Andrew, you might have thought a little bit about the intersection between policy and politics. Uh, so, so first, no, I think we should all be offended by the spectacle of Amazon pitting communities against each other uh, to see who could bend over backwards more for a preordained process. I mean, that's thousands of man hours put forward by like hundreds of communities around the, the country just to show the primacy again of a company saying like, I have jobs, you need jobs, like let's see what you can do. Uh, we should make any of these local tax inducements just 100% taxable and just get rid of the, the beauty contest forever. 
because from a national point of view, it makes no difference to us which city or state a company is based in as long as it's in the United States of America. So having someone move within the country produces no net economic benefits. All we're doing is giving the companies more money that some of these communities can't afford. A lot of the benefits they're promised don't materialize. We should all be offended by that. Uh, and but But what that... <laughs> does is it illustrates what Leslie's saying is that we have been so brainwashed into thinking that human worth and economic worth are the same thing that we are contorting ourselves in increasingly attenuated and ridiculous fashion. Why else would we imagine that we could turn thousands of coal miners into software engineers? That actually makes no sense. But when you look at it, you say, well, your current function has zero market value, thus you have no market value. Thus we will pretend we can turn you into something that does have market value because we can't even tell the difference anymore. My wife is at home with our two boys, one of whom is autistic. What is her market value? What is her work calculated at in GDP? Zero. And we have to get beyond the market's estimation of our worth because the market is about to turn on us in historic, catastrophic fashion. When artificial intelligence lands for real, and there are three and a half million Americans who drive a truck for a living right now, and the trucks start driving themselves in five to 10 years, do you want to be the person to say, hey, you were worth $46,000 last year, and now you're worth zero? Tell that to half a million 49-year-old men uh, who, who see you know, their livelihood about to go down the drain. We have to get our heads up and realize that the market is a highly flawed determinant of what our value is. We have to unbrainwash ourselves, really. Because this is what, the, what Leslie's point is, is like, hey, like we haven't been presented with that option. And the American yep. people are getting increasingly desperate. That's what led, I mean, Bernie Sanders legitimately could have won the nomination last time if the DNC hadn't sandbagged him and kneecapped him. And we all know that happened. And then Donald Trump, this avatar uh, you know, of, of distorted, dark, tainted populism, like actually is our president today. And, and people are looking up being like, huh, like, well, this is an aberration. I mean, this is not aberration. We're in the historic disintegration of our way of life. Our life expectancy has declined for the last three years due to surges in suicides and drug overdoses. Cheerleading this GDP number being at record highs makes no sense when your people are dying younger and sooner. So, uh, like, th this is the desperation we are in. Okay. People are looking around and saying, what does the democracy hold? Okay, I'm just going to... And, and our, gonna... our politicians aren't able to respond to the challenge because gonna, they're too busy gonna, going to fundraising days. I'm going I'm to stop you there because I got a feeling if I don't stop you soon that um, we're going to keep going. And it's not that I don't appreciate the direction you're thinking in, but I do want to bring the conversation on to the next part, which I think you'll appreciate, which is what does the state owe citizens? Um, would it be something like a UBI? But just a prelude to that, I do want to guess one more go at how deep this problem is, right, economically. Because I would say there's the prevailing consensus would be, um, yes, there are problems, right? There is too much inequality. We should be doing more to help workers. But it's a question of kind of fixes, essentially. They're, they're, that can be done through a series of reforms, many of which have already been mentioned. But it's not a profound shift in the capacity of markets to deliver increased well-being to most citizens. It's a failure to regulate the market to do that. But, there has, but what you're now saying, Andrew, is something's about to be very different, and maybe we're already getting the start, the start of that big difference, which is actually we're going to see a detachment between economic growth and people's well-being. The, the connective tissue between the economy growing and people getting better off is stretching and might break. It seems to me that the answer to that question profoundly influences everything we think about policy and politics from now. So I'm pretty sure I know where you're going to come out on that, Andrew, but I'd like to hear, first of all, Vanessa and then kind of Leslie on, do you think it's as deep as not just fixing, but really it ain't going to deliver in the way, the machine just is not going to deliver in the way for the reasons Andrew suggests? I mean, I am a... Uh, I, I have a pretty dim view of the future, but not for the same reasons precisely, but the, the dimness is similar, so I feel like a kinship on that front. And to me, the, and the place where I go where I worry is climate change. I, I don't think that there's any evidence right now that our current economy has any capacity to deal with a problem that is absolutely cataclysmic. And I don't think that there is any reason to believe or there's any evidence that, that the uh, kind of economies we've built in the past have any capacity 
to deal with genuine resource shortages. That is not what market economies have shown any evidence of. And so I think that we have a very, very limited period of time to make some absolutely revolutionary changes. But that's, uh, again, and I do want to come on, but um, that's, again, who do, whose fault is that, right? The fact that the market doesn't care about the planet is not the market's fault. Uh, any more, like, like capitalism doesn't care about the planet, but actually communism wasn't great either. <laughs> Um, and in fact, I think you can make and argue that the kind of despoiling of some of the lakes in the former Soviet Union is, would have been unthinkable in the Great Lakes of the US. And so um, I don't think that that's something we can put at the door of capitalism. It's at the point of a, a political system of any kind that just fails to act in the, lo in the long run. Is that fair? I mean, I think that it's clear that the economy of the future cannot look like any of the economies of the past. I don't think mercantilism would have handled the problem well either, at least as far as I can think off the top of my head. But the point is that we clearly need to make major changes, right? And those changes have to be different from what we've done, different from what's been tried in the past. And I want to add one more point to this. The other piece that I think is really critical to thinking about climate change is to get back to this question of who's, who's valued, right? Because I think that one of the, you know, when we think about what jobs have market value, uh, it's striking how often it is women and people of color whose jobs have no market value. Yes. And that is true no matter what work women and people of color do, right? When computer coders were women of color, they didn't get paid real well. It was still computer coding. Now it's really well paid. There are some other reasons as well, but the primary one I would say is that people with power get money. Okay, let's, I'm gonna let Leslie go first and then I'm gonna to come to you, Andrew, I promise. You know, I, I do think there's a debate uh, on right now among economists, which is fairly new. It's, you know, not my field, I'm not an economist, but it's about the anti-competitive behavior of corporations. It's about the concentration of power in corporations. It's about the things that they do. They, um, there are mandatory arbitration systems. There are no disclosure contracts. There are no compete contracts, there are all kinds of anti-competitive behavior uh, that are creating greater power for corporations and reducing the power of workers. And workers don't have, uh, they, just in the absence of unions, there's no one able to represent the workers. And, and even if unions are not going to be the solution in the future, that doesn't mean that there isn't gonna be some other institution that needs to be created. And that's why I think actually the talk is important, at least talking about these issues. You know, the, the, um, the new research in economics is just that, it's new. You know, you, we were not talking about these things five years ago uh, and about the severe anti-competitive nature of some corporations. So, uh, and then what are the solutions to those? I think we're in uncharted territory, not just because of technology, but because of the structure of capitalism and the need to create new institutions you know, uh, that are not going to be like the old institutions necessarily. You could, you we could, don't know what those are going to look like yet. But let's say you could unrig the market, you could have pro a properly co competitive market, move more from crony capitalism to a, a healthier form of capitalism, right? Which there are countries that are doing it in a healthier way. Uh, right. Not everywhere do you get such kind of political power being brought to bear in the economy. Let's say you could use a carbon tax. Um, and other f incentives through the market to actually just politically embed into the market uh, action on climate change. That might be enough, is what I'm hearing, but I'm not hearing that from you, Andrew. What I'm hearing is that even if you did all, and I'm uh, well aware how utopian that is, you're saying, no, 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 because the tech's coming, the AI is coming, and that's going to change everything. Yeah, there, there are two parallel crises that are working in tandem. One is climate change, two is the fourth industrial revolution, uh, that we're in the midst of the greatest economic and technological transformation in human history. Uh, and, and Donald Trump is a symptom of this transformation. The driving force behind his victory in 2016 was that we'd automated away four million manufacturing jobs in Ohio, Michigan, Pennsylvania, Wisconsin, Missouri, Iowa, and now we're going to do the same thing to millions of retail jobs, call center jobs, fast food jobs, truck driving jobs, as well as, I was an unhappy corporate attorney for five months and I can guarantee you can automate that job. Uh, so, um, so we have these two crises that are uh, unfolding in tandem and we are completely ill-prepared for either of them. So the, the best path forward is to try and uh, humanize our economy. And by this, what I mean is GDP is a measurement we made up almost 100 years ago, and even the inventor said three things. One, this is a terrible measurement for national well-being, and we should not use it as that. Two, 
we should include parenthood and motherhood in the number because they're so important. And three, we shouldn't include military defense spending because it has no economic value. And, uh, and of course, we ignored all three of those things and now we're riding GDP off a cliff. Um, and so what we should do is update our very measurements so that something like uh, environmental quality, mental health, childhood success rates, life expectancy, uh, proportion of elderly who can retire in quality circumstances. We have numbers for these things. We can turn them into the new GDP and then we can channel our market forces to try and improve our lives because the market is doing what it's designed to do. The problem is that capital efficiency and human well-being are diverging. So what you have to do is you have to actually make the measurements human well-being itself and then have that be the measurement of progress. That is our best path forward and that actually gives us a chance to try and make progress on climate change and the automation of jobs simultaneously in the time frame we have. Um, so I just want to move on to the, what the state or the collective owes the citizen. Let's go, um, go back to that. If we think that there's some social insurance system um, and that people should be in some way deserving of that, um, because it strikes me that the U.S. actually does pretty well insuring some people in a social security system for all its faults, has massively reduced pension and poverty, you know, Medicare is, is there, um, et cetera. But other people really underinsured, children, I would say, especially, there isn't a social insurance system. So it shows that it can be done, that the collective will can be there. The trouble is the kind of politics of it. And I'm thinking particularly here about something like a universal basic income. Um, which obviously you've argued for here, Andrew. And I really want to, I'm, I'm going to come, come to you last on this again, Andrew, because I just want to hear from the political scientists. What do we know about attitudes towards different kinds of transfer payments or different kinds of public goods to different kinds of people? <laughs> and what light would that throw on attitudes towards and the successful politicization of something like a UBI? Do you want to go first, Leslie? Uh, sure. Um, well, actually, Vanessa said it earlier. Uh, most of these policies are hugely popular. The fact that they're not enacted uh, is not um, is not the fault of a of a public that is um, is rejecting a sort of social classic social democratic welfare state. Uh, in fact, um, and I know Vanessa has done some research on that. When you look at the state level. Uh, you do see initiatives to raise taxes, particularly targeted taxes on high income households in order to do a few very popular things that, uh, that um, programs that actually have been really cut by the fiscal austerity in states. First and foremost, education spending hugely popular and it, it also is something that supports jobs because teachers uh, are um, employed through through those dollars, but also funding health care at the local level. And the third thing that's often very popular is public safety. Also, funding gets cut for fire and police. So um, these are the sorts of things where if you look at it at the local level, uh, they work in a sense because people can see that the benefits that they're gonna receive at the local level. They can see a targeted tax that says, okay, these revenues are gonna go to these very popular programs. And, th and they and might that's accountability, think they're it's, yeah. it's, it's transparency of benefits. Yeah. You know, at the federal level, yeah. we, we, we lose that. That's a, serve, that's a public good argument. Okay. Um, Unless it was straight cash, in which case it's actually very transparent. Well, yeah. Right. Yeah, which we're going to get to. Trust, we're absolutely, but Vanessa, you've done a lot of work in this field, and um, so I'm not going I'm, I'm to try and do justice to it, but I do think there's a sense anyway that certain kinds of transfer payments seem more politically sell and sellable um, and, than others, depending on who they go to and in what circumstances. That's right, and this sort of gets back to the point I was making earlier. One of the challenges of providing benefits to poor people is that uh, traditionally certain groups of Americans, particularly people of color, have been seen as undeserving people who do not work hard enough, and therefore, why would we be giving them money? And so there's a great classic book called Why Americans Hate Welfare, and it demonstrates that when welfare became a program that was racialized, that is to say it was perceived to be received by African Americans, uh, popular opinion turned against the program. And I think that that is a legacy that we have been dealing with from the beginning in this country. It's a legacy we will continue to have to deal with, but I think that there is uh, nothing more important than dealing with it. And in particular, I think what is vitally important, you know, especially as the country's demography has changed, it's, it mathematically is easier to make this change. Um, 
we need to think about what we provide to our citizens. I want to answer the question you asked about what the state should give to citizens. We need to think about programs, not about, uh, you know, whether someone might become dependent upon them, but what programs can we provide to citizens to make them independent? Right? And this is a very old Republican idea, right? That in order to be an effective citizen, you had to be independent, economically independent, right? You couldn't, if you had a boss who could tell you how to vote back when there wasn't a secret ballot, you know, that was a danger to democracy. And so many of the founders decided that what we should do is disenfranchise the poor. The alternative approach, which I think is a better one, might be to make sure that no one's poor. Uh, and so I think that for me, telling, telling the story of why we need to provide for every American in terms of making sure that everyone can be a citizen is the story that I would personally want to tell. So, but I think most people might react to that by saying the way you become independent is through skills, education, pre all of the services you just talked about. And they, and you're going to correct me if I'm wrong about this, a lot of people would say giving someone a check doesn't make them independent. You've just argued that it does. <laughs> um, but I'm not sure that that's the general view. <laughs> So uh, the conventional recipe is education and retraining, but when you dig in, the success rates of federally funded retraining programs for, let's call them manufacturing workers in the Midwest, have a success rate of between zero and 15%. Uh, they essentially do not work. And if you look at uh, the education, about 33% of Americans graduate from college. So if you subsidize that further, you're essentially subsidizing the top third of your population. Uh, and right now, the underemployment rate for recent college graduates or the proportion that are doing a job that does not require a college degree is between 40 and 44 percent. Um, so it's not like if someone graduates from college, there's this college-appropriate job waiting for them. 94 percent of the new jobs that have been created in the last number of years have been either temporary gig or contractor jobs that don't have meaningful benefits or pass forward. Hence this, this entire panel, which is that capitalism is not working. Um, so the, the great thing is that uh, if you were to, let's say, issue a freedom dividend of $1,000 per American adult uh, per month, then that would shore up many of the problems. It would create over 2 million jobs. It would start re recognizing and rewarding women uh, for the vital and unrecognized and uncompensated work that we all know women do more of in our homes and communities. Uh, it would also help marginalized communities and people of color uh, disproportionately because they have lower access to wealth and education and opportunity. Uh, and the great thing is this would become universally popular. There's one state that's had a dividend for almost 40 years, and that state's Alaska, where everyone in Alaska gets between one and $2,000 a year, no questions asked. And Alaska is a deep red conservative state. It was passed by a Republican governor. This is not necessarily left or right, it's forward. Uh, Martin Luther King championed this, Milton Friedman championed this, Thomas Paine championed this. J Jamie Dimon, the CEO of J.P. Morgan Chase, just came out last month and said um, America is having a national emergency in terms of the failure of our capitalist system and we should declare a negative income tax. You know what that is? It's an income floor where just everyone gets a certain amount of cash if you're below a certain level. So we need to get with the program own the fact that our economy has evolved in fundamental ways, get the public will to match up to the policy and the only way to do that is just send a message all the way to the top because unfortunately most of our legislators are held captive by corporate interests and there's a very limited way to make the feedback mechanism of democracy work. Is there a big difference though between one or two thousand a year in a state that had a natural resource that you could kind of argue was ch you know, just chance and so we should all benefit from it than twelve thousand a year out of general federal spending? just in terms of how it's perceived. I'm not sure that the analogy holds up between a pretty small dividend payment based on a natural resource and a much bigger one based on... Well, uh, the, the argument that one could easily make is that technology is the oil of the 21st century and that we are the owners and stakeholders of this society uh, and as the incredible wealth that is being produced in part by our own information, uh, then we deserve a dividend. Uh, and that's an argument I will be very glad to take to the American people. And we'll see the tech how the tech companies feel about <laughs> having drilling rigs arrive to extract all the money. I've just well, got a you know, great image well, in my I'm, mind now. I'm, suck it I'm, out. I'm <laughs> friends with dozens, hundreds of the technologists, uh, and some of them don't like this projection. But, but if you go to them and say, hey, are you automating away the jobs? Is inequality just at completely rampant out of control? Half of them will say yes. Well, it exactly. It depends what the alternative is, isn't it? Uh, if, the alterna if the alternative is to continue living in a kind of gil gilded age, well, it, wonderful it's, it's world, worse. but if it's 
Because what you say to them is like, is life better inside the bunker or outside the bunker? And half of them own bunkers. They and they've tested them out, and they've decided the sunshine is better. They do. I'm going to give a plug to Heather Boucher's piece in our series. We just republished at Brookings, which uh, argues for a more inclusive definition of GDP, including a distributional analysis, which actually the Bureau of Labor Statistics are working on. But I'm going to open this up. Let's get some questions from the audience. There are microphones uh, at the front, I think only at the front. So sprint, sprint to the microphone. Um, please identify yourself and keep your question short. And we, please, we do want... Please make it a question or at least have like a slight rising tone in your voice <laughs> towards the end. Would you agree that? All right, start there, gentleman well, there. First question, can you hear me? Is that a question? Yeah, but get a bit closer. Everyone needs to get close to the microphone. Pull, yeah, lift up. I wonder if there's an obstacle to all of this that sort of makes this conversation moot. And if that, if that obstacle is Citizens United, can we do any, is there any possibility of progress I'm challenging the interest you were just discussing? I know, Andrew, you were, you're for a constitutional amendment to overturn it. But is there anything we can do, or, I'm sorry, that's a stupid question. Is, a, uh, is this just, just an impediment that's not gonna yeah. go away? Yeah. Unless, unless there's something like constitutional amendment. The game's just gonna be rigged unless that gets uh, out of the way, uh, yes, basically. Yeah. Right, what I'm gonna do is take two or three, if that's okay with people, and then redistribute them. Yeah, the lady right behind you. Uh, thank you, my name is Marta, and uh, this question is mostly for uh, uh, Leslie. Um, I, I've noticed a kind of a revolving door, politicians and uh, rich people uh, from different sorts of life are the same. So uh, what will be the point of changing the political structure if the people who make policies are the same as the ones that benefit from the policies they make? Okay. And uh, if anybody else wants to contribute, then it would be great. So it Thank be you. A, it could be a different bunch of rich people making policy, um, basically. Okay, the gentleman over here on the right. Uh, yes, um, I enjoyed this series. I was here a few months ago when a number of economists, including Paul Krugman, was speaking. And the area that they spoke about, one of them was um, guaranteed income. And the other was the idea that uh, me mechan uh, automation was taking away jobs, yeah. and it was unanimous among the, the economists, which is a thing, of, you know, if I think... I don't believe it. Uh, yeah, but it was unanimous that they said that, well, I think it was overblown that uh, technology is taking away jobs because 120 years ago, 80% of the people right. lived on farms. Yep. Now it's 3% yep. work on farms, and we have a 3.6% unemployment rate. Yep. So where did those other people go? Well, they got, somehow got absorbed. The other thing on guaranteed income, they said, well, instead of giving people money, why not just hire them to do the things that we need? We have plenty of infrastructure. Have a guaranteed job rather than guaranteed in income, yeah. That's a lively debate in policy circles right now. So thank you. I'm, I'm going to come back to the panel. So we've got, uh, this is all just, you know, smoke until we change the way that financing happens. Um, we're just going to, the problem of rich people setting policy is not going to go away. And then this time, is it really different? And I'd say the gentleman has properly, I'd say, summarized the median position of economic thinking right now, which is that we just don't know yet whether it's really going to be different and that we've always had this fear that technology is about to wipe out all the jobs and not enough evidence yet to suggest that this time really is any different, certainly not to do anything as radical as that. And if we were, rather than to give them a check, give them a job. Leslie? Uh, don't take, have, feel you have to take all three, just pick and choose. Uh, you know, I'll, I'll just say very simply, we, we do know that uh, the ground game, you know, person-to-person -person contact in campaigns makes a huge difference. We know that very few people turn out at local elections. You know, this is doable. Um, we know that it's doable. There's a lot of political science research that talks about uh, how to launch a, a successful campaign without a lot of money. Um, so I, I am optimistic, actually. I think it's possible. We need possible. one on the panel. I think it's possible, right? <laughs> Pardon me? We need one optimist on the panel. Yeah. <laughs> okay, Andrew. Oh, well, we're testing it out right now. Um, uh, the, 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 it's actually easier to, to uh, pass a Democracy Dollars Act and give us all $100 to help uh, balance out the lobbyists than a constitutional amendment um, to, to fight it. Uh, but to the concerns about the fact that uh, we're not sure about what's happening to the jobs. Uh, you know, I wrote a book on the subject. I've looked at the economic underpinnings 
Um, the labor force participation rate right now in the U.S. is 63%, which is close to a multi-decade low, and the same levels as Costa Rica and Ecuador. And this is year 10 of an expansion. Uh, of the 4 million manufacturing workers that lost their jobs in the Midwest, I studied economics. What did, who here studied economics? Let's try this. What did our macroeconomics textbook would say to those 4 million, or would happen to those 4 million workers after they lost their jobs? They get new ones, retrained, reskilled, higher productivity economy grows all as well. So what actually happened to the four million manufacturing workers in the Midwest? Almost half of them left the workforce and never worked again, and of that half, uh, half filed for disability, and then you saw surges in suicides and drug overdoses uh, and Trump voting. None of that was in my economics textbook. So, so we, we need to actually get our heads off the textbook and go to communities and go on the ground. Then you get a sense of reality. Right. Um, so if someone talks about the, the headline unemployment rate, like they're just uh, you know, ignoring the depressed labor force participation rate, the lack of affordability, the underemployment that's ripping through the economy. Okay, Vanessa. Uh, I would just say a couple of quick things. First of all, in terms of Citizens United, I think it is correct to imagine that the Supreme Court is going to be an issue for any of a number of progressive reforms as it long has been. Um, on the question of the job guarantee, I think that it's important to remember that there is no contradiction between a jobs guarantee and UBI. They could happen simultaneously. They're not in any way at odds in terms of policies. The last thing I'd say is that um, it is possible that technology will eliminate jobs. It does not seem obvious to me that technology will eliminate work. Because for it to eliminate work, you'd have to believe all the children were educated, all the old people were cared for, all the parks were clean, all the roads had their potholes filled, and I don't think we're anywhere near running out of work. So the question is to how to convert work into jobs. And I think that that's a, a third piece of the puzzle. Okay, great. We're going to take some, some more oh. questions, the gentleman yeah. there. Let's do the same again. I'll take a round of three. Yes. Hi. I, I appreciate uh, Andrew's point on what's in the textbook and what's not in the textbook. That comes up very often in the classroom. Just what we expected to come from international trade it was not what actually happened. Um, to that point, though, the textbook does bring up um, the movement of capital and labor across borders. And I wonder, from your perspectives, how much of the issue that we're dealing with today is because we've globalized capital, we've allowed businesses to go across borders and to expand their reach in that sense, but we haven't necessarily applied that level of globalization to citizenship, where you can just move between countries when work is not available or when you're not trained for the work that is available within your borders. So I know it doesn't necessarily address all the automation and questions that come up as well, but I wonder how much of a role that globalization may play. Well, I'm very glad you asked the question because free trade is obviously a very big issue right now, and it was one of the things that I think was taken for granted in the previous consensus, was that it was going to be good, we're going to move together, and now that has been seriously threatened. Yeah, gentlemen. Yeah, listen, I moved to a small town in Fish called Fishkill, New York, and it was a perfectly well-run little town. You had groceries, you had uh, butchers, you had uh, 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 whatever, you know, druggists and so forth. And um, then there was a, an attempt, and it was, it was successful, uh, to have Walmart come into, t into the town. Well, uh, what, you know, here's, here's the crux which I think you need, you need to sort of address, which I think it needs to be, you need a social psychologist here. Uh, the whole town voted to have uh, Walmart come in, and, uh, you know, and what happened as a result of that, or the butcher went out, the, the grocer went out, the hardware store went out, and so forth. And, and all that panacea of working for a big corporation, uh, uh, you know, was, 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 it was terrible. Uh, and, well, they got jobs at Walmart, but, you know, they made them poor. Those jobs made them poor, whereas before you had a perfectly uh, uh, functioning town where the butcher paid okay. the grocer. Is there, is, there, so, is there a question? Yes. Why is there no social psychologist on here, on <laughs> this panel? And, and, you know, and also why... All right, that's a fair question. <laughs> and also, I want to have you address consumerism. Consumerism, And, and, okay. and the, 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 the flow right. of money from a little community into overseas banks. Okay, well, I think it's... Thank you for that. It's fascinating that they voted for it. That's democracy in action. Um, so, it's a, so it's a good tension that you've uh, identified there and the gentleman here. I'm Ray, and uh, I almost feel like I'm hearing the answer that I'm aware of which is a gentleman who believed in free trade, no taxation, but sharing the natural resource dividend. And the natural resource exists in every square inch 
of this country, not just in Alaska. The planet is the natural resource and could pay for all these problems and send everybody a check for tens of thousands a year, their share of the natural resources, resource dividend, for being alive. Human beings have a right to live. Human beings require natural resources to live. Human beings have a right to natural resources. Like a massive so sovereign that wealth That was Henry fund. George's right. syllogism. He got twice as many right. votes as Theodore Rose Roosevelt. But he was going to do it through land tax, right? According to Joseph Stieglitz and others, yes, yes. land rent. Yes. In other words, paying rent for something you did not create. Right. Yes. That that if it ever belonged to anybody. Yeah. If land belongs to everybody, then it was then, stolen okay. to begin with. All right. Good. But the Indians didn't claim ownership of the land. They didn't believe you could sure. own Got the it. land. Sure. Got it. So there's something here which is I think is quite profound, which is this the very idea of private property, <laughs> right? So now we're getting some really good socialist thinking, um, <laughs> and, I, and I do not mean that in a disparaging way. Socialist. This is prop this is actually you know property theft. The uh, very idea of private property is at the heart of a market economy. And that's absolutely true in the US. That's why Henry George was not very popular in the US. He was much more popular in Europe, um, where ideas of land taxation were taken kind of much more seriously. But should we be thinking much more radically? Please feel free to comment on that if you like. But the fact that a small town voted, voted yeah. for a Walmart yeah. and then didn't like the results, I'm not quite sure. I mean, if that's, or, or you don't think the results were good. Maybe people didn't know what they were voting for, et cetera. But that seems like a really good test case of allowing people to decide whether they want a Walmart or they want lovely you know, butchers, et cetera. Um, and then the trade point, which is are we moving away from free trade and how do we feel about free trade anyway? And how are the politics of free trade changing too, which I might ask uh, Vanessa to comment on too. But let's start with you, Andrew, this time. According to the studies I saw, uh, automation is a much bigger driver of job loss in many of these communities than, than globalization. Uh, the ratio is something like 75-25 uh, or 80-20 in the studies that I saw. So globalization is a big issue, but one of the things that we as a society have to, in my opinion, correct is that it's not immigrants that are driving economic dislocations. Uh, it's a transforming economy. And that if you go to an Amazon fulfillment warehouse, it is not wall-to-wall -wall immigrants, it's wall-to-wall -wall machines. Uh, and so that, that is the real driver of the anxiety and stress that many Americans are feeling. And unfortunately, immigrants have been scapegoated. And that, that's one aspect of globalization that you know, I, I think um, America is going to have to grapple with over the next number of years. It's also fascinating. People are now really freaking out about the falling birth rate because of the labor force. But you can solve that with immigration. So, Leslie. Uh, you know, I think that the, um, the issues of sort of local politics, I mean, one question I would have is how many people voted uh, for, for Amazon. Of course, there have been a number of movements. Uh, ag ag did I say Amazon? I meant Walmart, right? Uh, there have been a, a number of movements against Walmart. Um, generally, they've occurred in places where there are other jobs, larger cities or suburban areas uh, that I know of. Um, but again, these are tough issues to tackle in a relatively depressed area, right? Um, it's not depressed? At least was not a pretty depressed yeah. area. Yeah, well, I mean, at, at, at any point, it's, it's, it's difficult, as Richard said at one point, it's difficult to regulate one company, right? I mean, you, you need to take regulation throughout uh, the country, and uh, it, it's not something, it's same with wages. Uh, you need to take wages out of competition throughout the country so that corporations can't move from one place to another. Same with international trade. Uh, internet, international institutions and agencies need to tackle these kinds of problems about labor standards, about wages, um, and uh, about the environment. Yeah. These, are the que you know, these are the kinds of institutions that will solve these problems uh, uh, internationally, nationally, and, it's, and it is a tall order. You know, I'm, I, I'm not saying that it's not um, incredibly challenging to do these things, but but that's what we need to do okay. if yeah, these problems that, are going to be we solved. All, we all know that Walmart had a budget of millions of dollars to convince towns right. that it was a good idea to bring them in there, yeah. and that the butcher and the baker did not had a budget of zero. Right. Uh, and so that town council had like these really fancy documents showing them that Walmart's going to be right. great, and there was no countervailing sense of documents. The local businesses were outgunned. And even if the community, after the fact, said, you know what, this is a terrible idea. Like, now, I really miss my Main Street. You can't undo that decision. You can't all of a sudden be like, hey, like Walmart, turns out we made a mistake. Um, so, so this is unfolding in communities around 
the country, like the, the companies have all of the, uh, the materials and, and the resources and the people have none. Well, yeah, and oh, they're just the capacity to make the different trade-offs as well. The fighting against market logic, I think, is what we're kind of hearing a lot of on the panel so far. There are other kinds of social value, other kinds of ways to judge success, but this is the kind of hard facts of the thing. I want to let Vanessa in now. Yeah, I think that you're exactly right to imagine that we need to have a different narrative of how the economy works, because the one that is sort of has been sort of seeped into popular consciousness about as if corporations just have jobs sitting on the shelf, and if you're nice to them, they'll release those jobs into the wild, which is total nonsense. Is the, but that's the image that I think operates in people's minds and is a real problem. Um, I think it was worth saying a little bit more on the question of immigration, which came up in passing on the on the trade question, which is, you know, at the end of the day, people are not a box of widgets that you can just ship to another country. People live in communities, and they can't, it's hard to uproot themselves, right? So I think that we can't imagine that labor can ever flow the way that imaginary, you know, dollars can fly over the internet. And that's something that creates a power imbalance. The other thing I'll say is that when we're thinking about support for uh, a social safety net in the United States, um, that has been undermined by racism for centuries. Uh, in Europe, it has, in recent decades, been substantially undermined by anti-immigrant sentiment and in a very similar way. And I think that we're obviously also seeing that here as well. So I think that's a, a third piece of the puzzle that's really challenging. In addition to, you know, whether there can be the right jobs and whether there can, you know, whether small towns are ever gonna have the power to deal with corporations, the capacity of people to resist economic power is related to their sense of solidarity with one another. And all too often immigration um, people don't feel the same solidarity with new immigrants. It's interesting to see that in economics, place is now making a real resurgence. The idea that places matter um, wasn't something that traditional economics took very seriously. The idea was you just move, basically. You're just a unit of human capital, you can move. And that's been a real shift, I think, just in the last few years. Yeah, people I think economists may have encountered a sociologist at some point that's and right. learned exactly of the right. subject. And, and sociologists got the better of them in many of these areas, actually. Okay, so I'm basically pretty much out of time. I'm going to get into trouble if I take another couple of questions, so I'm just going to risk it. But in exchange, you've got to keep them super short. I'm going to cut you off at 30 seconds and do a lightning round, okay? You, and then you. Really short. I'm, uh, very short. I'm Chirag. Uh, uh, the statistic that you mentioned about uh, life expectancy going down, it's really troubling, and it's very new, but as a biotechnologist, even by the shortest of uh, estimates, it looks like overall human longevity for some people can be extended maybe modestly 150 years. Some of the more non-reasonable estimates, which right now seem crazy, are 200, 300 years. So if people can live this long in it, you know, it, I'm I'm almost 50, and I got tested that for for. But oh, you do look very good. Yes, <laughs> this is, <laughs> it's because of automation. So I, I just want to. All right, know, is there a question though? I mean, yeah, obviously no. we're admiring you, but can you? <laughs> what what's the? Can capitalism help us the same Live way? Longer. It, the same way information technology made people addicted to information. Okay. Can All we right. make? Uh, All right, fantastic, help us great. Uh, the lady here, really short. Yes, I understood Vanessa to say. Can you go to the microphone? Microphone, microphone, microphone. Thank you. Okay. Um, I understood Vanessa to say that politicians believe they can't interfere in the economy. And I wasn't sure what you meant by that. Mm. Did you mean that politicians think it's inappropriate for them, that they don't have a mm. method of interfering, that they fear it would be ineffectual? Exactly what did you mean? It's a fascinating Okay, well, I'm going to ask Vanessa to clarify. What I heard Vanessa mean is that politicians treat uh, econ nat market economies as some naturally pre-existing thing that you can't, is there something magical about it that you can't mess with rather than a deeply political institution that they actually can mess with pretty I seriously. See. Why don't you take that directly, Vanessa, and then we'll come out to that. Well, I'm going gonna, I'm gonna, um, to say two things. One, a, a point I meant to make earlier, which is that legislators also have a very bad sense of the political opinions of their constituents, and there's more and more research on this. So to some extent, legislators are not acting in the public interest in part because they misperceive what the public interest is. But I think Leslie made that point. I think yeah. you are the one who was talking about uh, the capacity to intervene in the economy. Ah. So I'm going to pass it. Sorry. I think, I think, I think you, you both made the point yeah, in yeah, different yeah. ways. Yes, I, I think you, you summarized yeah. it exactly. You know, it's, it's, it's the power of the economy, what, what we were talking about earlier, uh, that jobs are supreme and in, in it's a kind very, of untouchable in, in a very yep. minimalist kind of way. It's, it's sort of a lack of political imagination about the future, I would argue, and how we yeah. can control 
uh, the, the transformations that are undergoing, that we're undergoing in the economy. I'm going to ask How you, we can politically control those transformations. So I'm going to ask you each to just ask my, I'm going to throw in my own question. Uh, this will be the final, final round. Um, the point about life expectancy um, allows me to kind of point out that whilst average life expectancy might be dropping slightly, it's because the inequality in life expectancy is growing. The life expectancy among those who are at the top of the income distribution more affluent. I, I'm not suggesting they're going to live to be 200, although you clearly will. Um, <laughs> But, uh, but it's the inequality in life expectancy which is reflective of all the other deep inequalities we've spent. Um, so th that's one of those occasions where the average is really dangerously misleading in some ways because it's disguising this huge inequality. So Andrew, I'm going to give you the last word, Andrew, but um, I just wanted to invite all three of you. I'll start with you, Vanessa. Some of this feels to me as if people believe, and I'm going to say I believe it for the purpose of the argument, that there is an individualistic ethos in America. It's, it's in the DNA that you do make it on your own, you are, you are mistress or master of your own destiny, that government overreach gets in the way, and that everybody can make it, um, and that every, every American, however poor, sees themselves as what someone described as a temporarily embarrassed millionaire. And if everybody sees themselves as a temporarily embarrassed millionaire, and you know what, in America you can make it, and we're on our own, and it's a meritocracy, and individual, is that ethos as deeply rooted as I think it is? Because if it is, then maybe all of this is for naught anyway. And if not, then why do we keep, I'm not, why do we keep getting the outcomes that we get? Or why do we still keep talking about ourselves that way? Vanessa, and then I go. So classically, uh, people would say that Americans are theoretical uh, conservatives, say they like small government, operational liberals, which is means if you ask them about any major thing government does, like education, healthcare, they think we should be spending more on it. So um, no, I don't think Americans are knee-jerk opponents of government at all, um, because they have so consistently said that they would like the government to be doing more when it comes to looking after the American people. Where I think you'll find the tradition of anti-tax sentiment in the United States actually stems from slavery. Um, if you look at, for instance, the parts of the Constitution that make it very difficult for the federal government to tax, those are intended, they are, one of them is embedded in the three-fifths clause. They are intended to protect a certain kind of property and to maintain a certain kind of um, racial divide that would prevent solidarity between working people. But I think that, that idea that Americans um, insist upon doing it on their own, it's just not backed by the data. Great. Leslie, did you want to add anything? The only thing I would add to that is, is that if there is anything to it, then, and, and I think it's very relevant to something like uh, the UBI, is that there is some value to work uh, and some kind of fundamental value to work. I don't think that's peculiarly American, by the way. It just happens to be part of the political environment here, and it's part of our history as well. We don't have a history, part, partly because of racial inequality, we don't have a history of a strong welfare state, right? It's not embedded in our culture. Yeah. Uh, I don't think it's inherent in any way. And also, uh, the U.S. had wild economic growth uh, in the post-World War II period that was widely shared. So work was, I, I mentioned this in my opening statements, the civil rights movement was about economic inclusion. Yeah. It was about inclusion in, in, in the economy. It was about opening the doors to the capitalist work economy. And employment. It, it wasn't about extending welfare benefits. So if that's, if that, <laughs> Although if, that was important too. I think so if work's important, and I, think I, and I do agree with that, but I also think Vanessa's point is this can be a kind of mythical thing about US individualism. And I'm just thinking about UBI in that context. On the one hand, it seems like this incredible um, piece of social insurance, very expensive you know, checks being cut for 12,000 to everybody. On the other hand, it's incredibly individualistic because it gets you away from sort of more paternalistic forms of welfare and it just says, here's the money. And how you then decide to top it up or do with it is kind of up to you. And so I can't figure out whether UBI is actually quite an individualistic policy or whether it's a deeply collectivist one. But you know. <laughs> Oh, I, I, the one reason why it has such universal appeal is that libertarians love it because they like as long as the government's not making my decisions, I like economic autonomy and freedom. Liberals and progressives and Democrats like it because they know it would mean more money in the hands of children and families. It would mean better health, education outcomes, mental health, lower stress levels. Uh, it would empower millions of American women who are right now in exploitative or abusive jobs or relationships to actually improve their lives, and the Democratic Party can either talk about empowering women or do something about it, and I believe we should do something about it. But I, I wanna look around this room and say, like, there are a couple hundred of you here tonight, 
And I have a feeling you're all here because you sense that things are trending in a very negative direction. Like no one saw this topic and was like, oh, things are fantastic. I suppose I will come here about how great they are. You know, like you sense that there, that there's like a real ill afflicting uh, our body politic for sure and our economy and it is becoming increasingly punitive uh, and inhuman and we're not sure what to do about it. But the people in this room you know, it's like, it's actually a, a very uh, high level commitment that you came, it's like, I'm gonna spend a couple of hours and learn about this. We need to do something about it as fast as possible for the sake of our children, our grandchildren, and leave a society that we're still proud of to them because we do not have limitless time. You know, it's like, and we know what must be done. The time for talk is well past and now we must act. Thank you. Uh, I would just like to thank all of you for coming, encourage you to check out the work of the Stone Center here at the City University of New York. Check out the Broken Capitalism series at The Guardian and the work of um, all the scholars that you've heard from tonight. Please join me in thanking our distinguished panel.